Okay, so my name is Mikolai Kromka. I work at Virtus Lab for some time. Uh, so right now I'm a software engineer. We're working with Greg uh, on this uh, data analytics platform for Tesco. We are uh, at Virtus Lab. We are mostly focused on the Scala ecosystem. Uh, and I really like the, the Spark part of this of, of, uh, of this stack. So maybe uh, a little bit introduction fr from you. So how many of you have used Scala uh, on production? Okay, that's not not much. Okay, and how many of you have used Spark? Okay, so w was it Python API mostly? Java. Okay, uh, Java. Okay. Okay, so we, I'm going to uh, speak a little bit about the Spark SQL. This is the structured part of the structured pro processing of the uh, Spark framework. So bef before we, we go through that, uh, I would like to have a, a, a short introduction and the history of the SQL itself. So I'm not sure if you, if you know, but it's almost 50 years when Kot uh, proposed his relational model for the databases. Uh, so it was, uh, it grouped tuples into relations, and based on that uh, idea, the SQL, uh, as we know it, grew. Uh, one of the first implementations was at IBM, where actually code uh, worked. Uh, and th there is one in interesting fact that uh, after, after, afterwards, uh, a company called Relational Software Incorporated started working on their uh, relational database management systems, which was 40 years ago. And right now, this company is called Oracle Corporation. And yes, they have still the, the same, maybe a little bit upgraded uh, database man management system. Uh, so yeah, this is the selective history. So uh, the next big thing was uh, Apache Hive, uh, which brought the SQL-like querying on uh, to the big data world. So. Uh, First, the, the, the Hive was open sourced by Facebook at 2008. Uh, so we could just query, create simple query uh, queries as in SQL that uh, under the hood uh, created complex, uh, complex map reduce jobs to get the data uh, from, from our system, from our cluster. After we, <coughs> we are going to focus on the, on the Spark. So Shark is uh, one of the projects that was uh, started by guys from Databricks, the, the, the company behind the Spark. Uh, so it was supposed to be a better Hive. They actually took the code from, from Hive itself and they replaced the execution engine with Spark. Uh, well, it wasn't a great solution, but it worked better than, than Hive. But uh, it has shown that uh, there are possible optimizations in the, in the Hive and in the big data world. So that's why they started Spark and Spark SQL, which was published. The, the first uh, first race was in 2014. The first public race was in 2014. Okay. So so before we go to the Spark SQL, so what is Spark itself? So uh, Spark is a is an engine. It's a framework for uh, large scale data processing and manipulation. Uh, one of the main features of, of Spark, all of the Spark applications are built on something called RDDs, which are the resilient distributed data sets. You can think of them as, uh, as, of, uh, as of a container for your data that can be distributed across all your nodes in, in the cluster. Uh, so why, why are they are called resilient and distributed? Distributed because, as, as I say, they can be distributed across the cluster. But also they are resilient because uh, Spark, uh, on, on, on the RDD, you can invoke some methods using your favorite programming languages like Scala. Uh, so if you invoke an action or a transformation on, on RDD, uh, then you get a new, a new RDD because they are immutable. Uh, how many of you have heard about the immutability and functional programming? Yes, yeah, so, so immutability means that uh, you don't change the state of your objects, you create a new object based on your transformations. So this, this is something that, that came with functional programming, I think. Uh, and we really like it in, in, in the in Scala world. Uh, so yeah, so, so we create a new RDD for every operation. So for example, we, we have uh, our set of users, and we want to, uh, of, or for us of user accounts, and we want to 
give them 10 pounds each. So we want to update the, our set with the new value of, the, of their balance, uh, ba balance account in, in the account. So we create a new uh, RDD, and the new RDD contains a relation to the old one, so to the parent one. And if we go through all of the processing steps in our Spark application, then we will, uh, we will have this graph of calculations that is automatically translated by Spark itself to the, uh, to the code executed in the, node, in, uh, in the nodes in your cluster. Uh, so th this can be seen here uh, in those stages. So, so uh, wh why, why, why Spark is, 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 uh, is so great? Because it can be seen as, a, uh, as an evolution to the MapReduce model. Uh, in, in MapReduce, how many have heard about the MapReduce? OK, not bad. So you need to create those MapReduce steps for, for, for your processing. So, so you manually need to code every map and reduce steps. Spark does everything f for us. So we just write our uh, code in our language, in our programming language. And then uh, based on this uh, lineage of the RDDs, of those region distribu distributed data sets, uh, Spark generates stages. And inside stages, we have tasks. So those stages, this, uh, those stages, the tasks in the stage can be run in parallel. So this, is, this can be seen as a map step of the uh, MapReduce. And then between the stages, there is a shuffling. So it requires sending data across the nodes, uh, across the network. Uh, so th this is, the, this, is uh, th this barrier uh, for, for, for uh, synchronizing your application. Uh, so another important thing with, with RDDs is that they are resilient, which means that if we, if for example, one node in our cluster dies, then we can, because we have this lineage and we have all the data uh, that we started with, then we can re recompute the, the, the failed parts uh, automatically. So Spark does it uh, by itself. Uh, yeah, so, so based on, 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 on top of Apache Spark, there, are, there is a lot of libraries, uh, like SQL that we are going to talk a little bit more, the machine learning, uh, graphics for uh, graph processing, and so on, streaming. Uh, and it is one of the most active open source projects, so that's, that's really important, I think, because due to that, the, the, due to the fact, uh, the documentation and all of the information in, uh, in the web are not so actual. Uh, they, don't, uh, they don't correspond to the, to, the, to the most recent API or uh, the most recent uh, uh, code. OK, so, so just quickly, through, let's go through the simple use case we, with Spark. This is, the, uh, this is uh, Spark shell. Actually, this is Scala shell, but we can use the Spark context, which is SC. This is Scala, by the way. Uh, how many of you heard about uh, Lambda expressions? OK, great. So Lambda expressions are just functions that we pass to another function. You, you can see, uh, uh, you can see, the, see them this way. So we create a new RDD from a sequence of integers. Uh, the SC parallelize is the, is the function that we use to create an RDD in the Spark world. Then we want to filter only those uh, elements of this uh, RDD that are bigger than one. And then we want to map all of, the, uh, all of the elements inside to a string. That will be number one, uh, number two, for example. <coughs> So as you can see, those are the, the, three, the three first steps. But uh, another important thing is that uh, RDDs are uh, lazy, which means that nothing gets executed uh, in those three steps. Uh, those are only the transformations. And if we don't call an action which uh, returns some result to a user or saves, uh, saves a result to a disk or uh, prints it to the, uh, on a console, like uh, for each, uh, then we, it, nothing will get executed. So the whole processing is executed in this step for each print line. And as you can see, we, uh, in the last part, uh, we have a function uh, to debug string, which returns this lineage of the RDDs. So we, as you can see, we created a new RDD, then we created the second RDD based on the first one, and so on. So the RDD3 has, uh, has a relation to the RDD2. 
and RDD2 has to RDD1. So that's why Spark can compute the graph of calculations. So yeah, th this is what is presented on the, on the bottom. OK, but uh, do we need anything else? So because we created a simple application, but we can extend it uh, as much as we want. We can pass any functions to, to, those, uh, to, to those operations. So no, we, we, if we have a modern framework that uh, wants to process uh, large, uh, large amounts of data, then we re require something more. Uh, so what don't, what don't we have in the, in the plain vanilla Spark? So the data that we uh, cope with are usually structured. So, but, but the RDDs can contain arbitrary code, uh, arbitrary data. We can invoke arbitrary Scala or Java or Python functions. So we, we, cannot, uh, we cannot leverage this information to optimize our queries. For example, we would like to store the data in columnar for, uh, format because it will be much, uh, much more efficient. We cannot do it because of, the, because of this limit. Uh, the another thing is that mo many of the users uh, of the big data systems, the data systems, uh, are analysts who know only SQL or Hive languages. So we would like to make them available for this uh, for those applications that we create using Spark. Uh, we also, if, if you work for a large company, then most probably you have a large code base with. Uh, uh, queries, uh, Hive queries that take, like, I don't know, uh, 30 or uh, even hundreds of lines. Uh, so we would like to be able to reuse them, uh, at least uh, in the beginning of migration from Hive or any other solution to, to Spark. Uh, also, the, the, the another thing is, uh, important thing that we, we need to, uh, that, that we would like to have is to connect to different data sources. Not all of them are as, uh, as well structured as, for example, relational databases. We don't want to create uh, connect only to rel relational databases. We want to, for example, connect to uh, some REST service with JSON API, uh, and, and so on. So <coughs> we can use Spark SQL, which is the built on top of uh, Spark, uh, Apache Spark, to for, for that purpose. So this is just a simple example that we have three flavors of the using Spark SQL. So we have a simple data frame. It, it's a simple data set. You can think of it as a, as, a, as a simple data set, which has a schema. So we have a, a, a set with uh, uh, values that have name, which is a string, and balance, which is a double. So we can, we can either use plain SQL queries to uh, to get the details from uh, from this table, from this da data set. We can use the data frame API, which is the second one. And also we can use the data set API on the bottom. Those queries are incorrect, because you, you cannot divide name by 10. Well, maybe you could, but. Uh, uh, but the most important thing is that they differ in different ways. So the, the first one, when we uh, print, when, when, when we write an incorrect query, the, uh, it will compile without any problem. This code will compile without any problem. Uh, and during the runtime, we will have an exception that we, you, you cannot cast name as double. Uh, the same is with the data frame API. Uh, we can, uh, w this code will compile, but it will fail during the runtime. Uh, the advantage of using the data frame API, that the second one, is that if we have any uh, syntactic errors, then they will be checked during compilation. And the, the, the last one, the, 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 the most recent API, which is the data set, uh, allows us to, to code in, in uh, Scala or in any other language. Uh, and the uh, values, the, the types, will be checked during the compilation time. So. This, if this query would take, I don't know, five hours, and maybe this, uh, this uh, division wouldn't be visible for, for the first rows, uh, then it would take time until we see that th there's a problem with, with this code. And this we can see during the compilation. So th that's the main advantage of using the, the data sets. Uh, the problem is that not all of those parts are uh, uh, that Spark is not able to optimize the, them in the same way. Oh, sorry. 
Okay, so, yeah, so, so this is just a summary of what I said. So we, with the plain SQL queries in, based on Spark, this is on top of Spark SQL. Uh, everything, all of the errors are, uh, are checked during the, the runtime. Using the data sets, on the other hand, uh, we, we know everything about it in the compile time, during the compile time. OK, so we see that we can use this Spark SQL. Let's create a, just a simple, uh, simple application uh, that normal user in, in a big company that wants to I don't know, uh, create reports would, 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 uh, would create. So we have we, uh, imported some implicits. It's not, uh, it's, it's not a problem for, uh, if you don't know implicits. The important part is that we have a schema. Actually, we have a class defined. Uh, uh, the case class person, and we create a new data set uh, by reading the uh, JSON file and mapping it to this type, to this person type. And as you can see, we can uh, print it out. It prints uh, three, three, three people. And then we can use the filtering uh, on the age attribute to generate a new data set. And then it will you compute and calculate correctly the, the, the result. As you can see, only one person is, uh, is above uh, 65 years. So what we actually did here, we created a fu fully functional uh, Spark application using the dataset API without touching the RDD API. So the, this base Spark API that was supposed to be uh, used as a building block for all our applications. So how is it possible? Are we in some kind of different framework? So is Spark SQL different framework than the Spark itself? Because we, we have no RDD here at all. So no, that's, that's not true. Hopefully you can see it. Uh, that's not true. Uh, we have this catalyst optimizer, uh, which is the part of Spark SQL uh, library. And it takes takes a query, our SQL query, our data frame uh, query, or data set query, and then uh, creates some kind of plans. You can think of a plan as a, as a tree, uh, as an expression tree. Uh, and then uh, performs some, some steps, and then creates the RDDs itself. So this is, this is pretty important uh, image. Uh, for Spark SQL, because this is not like in a common Spark application with only with RDDs that we just create this lineage uh, of of the R of, of the RDDs and it gets executed on the nodes. We go through those mapping steps and optimization steps, and then we the Spark, the catalyst uh, generates the code which will be invoked, which will be executed in the RDDs on the nodes. So let's maybe go through. Those th those uh, steps. So we are in the analysis phase. So for example, let's see we have uh, a data set which contains uh, account uh, uh, account value which has name and the balance. So we can uh, we can use uh, explain method to get all of the possible uh, all of the plans that were generated by Catalyst. So all of those steps that we see here can be seen uh, through this explain method. So we want to filter this, this account data set and, and see what, what, what happens under the hood. So first, first part is to parse the SQL query or, the, or use the API uh, to, get, to, to get the parsed logical plan. As you can see, we have some local relation on the bottom. Uh, and then based on it, we filter it based on the balance. Uh, this local relation contains two values, two attributes, but as you can see, the filter doesn't have balance hash 95. It means that the, those attributes are unresolved. And the first step, the analysis, is using external catalog, which is uh, part of the Spark SQL as well, uh, to resolve those, th those parts. And as you can see, after, uh, after analyzing it, we have analyzed the lo logical plan with the uh, balance uh, resolved. And also, it knows that the balance is of double type, so it casts 10 to double. So this is done automatically during the analysis phase. OK, so the next part is to optimize it. This is called Catalyst Optimizer, so we would like to optimize something, right? So we have this uh, complex tree uh, of, of our query. 
we translated it to, to a tree. We resolved all of the attributes. Uh, so we would like to perform some optimization uh, to, 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 per to per perform some optimizations. And right now, the log logical optimization in Spark SQL is based on, uh, on, rule, on rules. So there is, uh, Spark SQL contains a lot of uh, different rules, different, uh, yeah, different rules as, uh, that can be seen as uh, subtrees that match given rule. So, so we, if our tree or part of, of this tree matches uh, some some other subtree that was defined by the creators of the of the uh, optimization rules, then it will get transformed, and thus it will be optimized. So one of the one, one of the uh, main uh, main optimization uh, uh, one of the main optimizations can be. Uh, pushing down the predicates. So we want our filtering to be as close to the source as possible because uh, if, uh, if this filtering happens uh, on the bottom, so uh, just as we uh, read the data from the table or from, from a file or, uh, or something like this, then during the, uh, during the next uh, processing steps, we don't need to, for example, join as many uh, as many rows as uh, as uh, as before. So you, you can see it that during logical optimization in this uh, in this example, the filter part was pushed before the project part. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of different different optimizations: predicate pushdown, boolean expression uh, simplification. I think it's called uh, a lot of different different things. I think uh, in standard Spark. Uh, in, in, in Catalyst, you have like 30 or 40 different uh, di different rules for it. You can also create your own rules uh, if you, if you need it, and you can inject it to the to the Spark to the to the Catalyst. Okay, so before we go to the to the next part, the, the physical planning, let's uh, let's quickly go through the something called joins. You, m most of you, I think, uh, heard about the joins, like inner join, left join, cross join, and so on. Uh, but this is not what, we, what I want to talk about. Uh, we, want to, uh, we need to know what the actual execution of join in a distributed application, such as Spark uh, application, how is it performed? So uh, Spark has a lot of different types of joins. I will focus on, on two of them. One is the broadcast hash join. So it works like this. When we have two data sets that we want to join together based on some, on some column, then if the, if the data are distributed across all of the nodes uh, in our cluster, then if one of the data sets is much smaller than the, than the other one and it can fit into memory of all of the executors, then we just need to send this, distribute this small data set across all of the nodes and then do the join on those nodes itself. So uh, this is what the broadcast hash join is, is doing. Actually, Spark uh, under the hood is uh, uh, using peer-to-peer -peer algorithm to, uh, to, to distribute the, 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 the smaller data set. The second one is the sort merge join. Uh, I d I'm not sure, have you heard about the uh, um, merge sort? This is a sorting algorithm. Maybe some of you have heard. This is pretty similar. So we, first we sort the data on, on a given node. And then, because they are sorted, it's much easier to find the corresponding values for the same. Uh, for example, if you join on, on ID, then those IDs will be uh, in the same place, n n near themselves on after sorting, right? Because th this is the same value. Uh, so uh, this is what is uh, what is inside the sort merge join in, in, in the Spark. So after we got through those uh, two, two uh, join strategies, join types, then we can see the physical planning. What is happening actually on, on, on the top? We have optimized logical plan, and after physical planning, we uh, get a lot of different physical plans. Uh, after the cost model is, uh, is used, we have only one selected physical plan. So what does it mean? Because if we have a query and it is optimized, we can uh, execute it, execute it uh, in different ways. 
So how to choose the best one? Usually, this uh, means that we, the, the, the application itself would need to know, uh, need to have statistics on the data in those data sets. So if, for example, one, uh, one uh, data set is smaller, then we can do the broadcast hash join, for example. Th there are a lot of different strategies uh, for the, uh, the cost-based optimization. Right now, unfortunately, Spark uh, has only support for uh, the cost-based optimization only for the choosing the join algorithm. The full cost-based optimization will be shipped with Spark 2.3. Uh, so hopefully in, 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 not, not too long ago, not, not too long from, from now. Uh, so yeah, so we are choosing one plan based on those join, uh, uh, on, on, those, on the sizes of those, uh, of, of those table. And actually this, uh, this value, how big the table should be, the data set should be to be broadcasted is set in co configuration. So this is, the default is 10, 10 megabytes of, of data. So if we have a, a data set that is larger than uh, 10 megabytes, then we won't use the uh, broadcast join. We'll use the sort map join. Uh, but we can, we can hack it. So we have a smaller, smaller um, uh, data set right now. And as you can see, there is a bro the, the, the physical plan that was chosen, this is the chosen physical plan, uses broadcast hash join. But we can ch change the configuration to minus one. And then if we have, when we have the same optimized logical plan, this is exactly the same. Uh, the chosen algorithm for joining is the sort merge plan. So this is the, the, the physical planning part. And the last step is the code generation. Uh, this is, I think, uh, it's hard to read about the, this code generation uh, on the web because uh, most of the, 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 the documentation or the blog posts from, uh, are, are from two years, I think, 2013 or 14, sorry, 14. Uh, so usually they say something about the quasi quos This uh, advanced Scala feature which allows us to generate the code and then and also uh, check the uh, compile it uh, on the fly, uh, check the types, types on the fly. So we can produce the valid Scala code uh, uh, on the fly. Uh, right now, uh, right now uh, they, they, they dropped the support for, for uh, quasi quotes in, in Catalyst. And they are using the Janino compiler. This is a Java compiler. So they just uh, uh, concatenate some strings to uh, create Java application, to generate Java code. And then it, it gets compiled to the bytecode using the Janino compiler. And then it gets executed on the, on, on, on the nodes. So wh why, why do we need the code generation? So you can see it. For example, we have a simple expression like x plus y plus 1. If we have this expression as a part of our larger plan, this is just a subtree. This contains a couple of nodes. So the addition is a node. The x, y are nodes. The one is a node. <coughs> so if, uh, if we would leave it like this, it could get executed on the nodes. But this uh, going traversing through this subtree of this x plus y plus 1 would be invoked and executed for every row that we that we calculate that we that, that we transform so we can generate a code to uh, automatically do this to do this addition because this is a fairly simple operation right why why do we need to go through all of those uh, nodes so th that's why we need it uh, to, to to get uh, to, to make it more efficient uh, so uh, Catalyst in the, in the last part, uh, in the last step, uh, based on the uh, physical plan that, that, that was chosen, generates the code. So you can see this is just a part. This is, uh, uh, I don't know, like 100 lines of, of Java uh, generated code. So it's not, not, not easy to, to, to read. Uh, right now, also, because previously in Spark uh, 1.6, the generation was only for the expression evaluation. Right now, uh, some parts of, of the, uh, some, some, uh, some plans, some subtrees uh, support the whole stage code generation. So not, not only the expressions. And the last thing where we can check what is happening with our application is the Spark UI. 
So those uh, and it is uh, it is useful to to, to look uh, even even if you think you, you know what is happening for for example based on the based on the uh, generated code or on the plans that that were printed because only then you see the actual execution and the actual uh, RDDs uh, and stages that that, that get uh, executed on on your cluster and this is important uh, also because of one fact that. I told you, told you about three different flavors of uh, Spark SQL API: the dataset, data frame, and plain SQL. So, and I said also that uh, not all of them can get optimized uh, as well as the others. So this is su such such example. We have a dataset, which is the, the 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 most recent API, and using simple map operation, we can we have this whole stage code code gen part. Uh, uh, as, a, as one task, and when we tr do try to do a s somewhat similar thing with flat map, uh, which is a, a different operation which is not supported by the catalyst uh, as, as, as well, then this whole stage code gen gets generated, uh, will get split by the map partitions. So this is important to know that not all of the API functions that we have in Spark SQL will be uh, as useful uh, uh, as the others. So yeah, let's look, please look at the Spark UI. Uh, OK, th this is, uh, this is uh, s something different. This is another type of optimization performed by, by the Catalyst itself. This is called vectorization. So for example, if you have uh, an operation that you perform on all of the, all of the rows, uh, for example, addition or something maybe more complex then sometimes it is uh, if this uh, function this uh, this uh, transformation uh, is uh, intensive and it, uh, it's uh, complex uh, then most probably to avoid having some unnecessary v virtual calls uh, f function calls you would like to group part of the rows together and then iteratively in, in, a, in a simple loop go through all of them. Th this would uh, allow us to, to, uh, to have it more efficient because we would avoid those uh, v uh, virtual function calls. So as you can see, this, uh, this is important, for example, when choosing a data source for your, uh, for your uh, application. So the, the JSON source is not optimized. Uh, it doesn't have uh, all of the features that the Parquet source has. Uh, so vectorization happens when you group the rows in a batch and then process the, the batch at once. So you can see it in the generated code that we have uh, for the parquet we have the we, ha we have processing on on uh, on a batch level, not on the uh, row level. Okay, so so uh, some some advice. So uh, the dataset API it is uh, it is fun to use because this is Scala, if you use Scala, of course. But this is functional programming. So uh, this is what we like to, to, to do. We would like to implement everything in, 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 this, in this language. But some of the features that, uh, that, that some of the functions that are exposed in this API may not be as good uh, as you think they, they, they are. Uh, so also the Spark SQL, even though it's called SQL and it's uh, has all of the features that uh, standard SQL, uh, the, 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 the SQL standard has. It's not, it doesn't have all the, all of the features that the traditional relational database management system has. So for example, we don't have in the indexes in, the, in Spark SQL. So if you don't, uh, if your application uh, doesn't transform terabytes of, uh, or gigabytes of, of data, then the simple Postgres and simple application that takes the data from Postgres will be enough. Uh, another thing is using, the, as, as I said before, we can create a data frame from RDD. There is a function to DF method to DF, uh, but we should avoid it because it is not as optimized as a specific data frame reader uh, for, for given source. Uh, 
two important elements are to analyze the plants that uh, Catalyst produced. So those elements that I that I that, that I have shown you, uh, all of those uh, logical plants and so on. And also the Spark UI is is very useful because you actually see what is happening on 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 your cluster. So thank you. Any questions? Can you use Spark in Python or Sonic or Scala? So the question was, can you use Python? Uh, Python? Yes, yeah, so you, you can you use Python uh, in Spark, right? Spark in Python, yeah. Yes, the uh, Spark has uh, APIs in Scala, Java, Python, and I think R as well. So yeah. And most of the, for example, there are a lot of use cases where an analyst or a data scientist uh, connects to your cluster and writes s a simple plain Python queries, uh, uh, queries in Spark SQL to, to get his data. Yeah. Anyone, anything else? So do you run this in production or still more of the exploration phase? No, we, we, we run it in production. Yeah, th th this is uh, one of the uh, one of the you know, most popular technologies right now. And how big is the cluster? Right now, our cluster. Uh, our cluster is not used only for the Spark jobs. Uh, I think it's 1,700 nodes, uh, 72 terabytes of RAM, I think. Yeah. yeah. But most of them, I, I think, are Hive queries. I'm not working on, on, on such use case right now. I think you could do it, yeah. Uh, but how are you then? So this 1,000 nodes, is, uh, so there's different data and different jobs? Or, uh, who starts you can, you can connect, connect to the cluster manager, uh, for example, by your uh, Spark shell. And then you can run queries on it. No, so you can, you can create also uh, some temporary views which are accessible using this catalog that I, that I mentioned. There, there is this catalog which uh, has some, uh, some uh, information about the existing views that you created, and you can query them, th th those views. They are cached on, on your cluster. But you mainly use this as a byte processing system? Right? Yes, yeah. You can use streaming. Well, oh, I, I actually forgot to, to mention one thing. Why is Spark SQL important? Because the streaming there is something called structured streaming uh, in Spark SQL. Right now, I think it's experimental. But for your, uh, uh, for your streaming jobs uh, in Spark, Apache streaming jobs, the processing inside one window, one batch, one micro batch, is uh, performed using the data frame API, the data set API. So that's why also this, this is important. Not all, all the features are right now supported, but uh, in the future, the, it will be the, the, the main API. So once again, which version of Spark was This was, uh, I've, uh, this was 2.0. Yeah. Yeah. How do you identify and solve performance bottlenecks in Sorry? How do you identify performance bottlenecks in Spark? And how so, so, the question is, so the question is, how do you find and uh, fix the performance bottlenecks? Okay. Uh, so yes, yeah, the, 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 the best thing to do is to look at your Spark UI. Uh, most, of the, uh, mo most of the problems with Spark jobs is usually spilling the data to disk or uh, a lot of shuffling between the nodes. So you have on, on your Spark UI, you can check uh, whether there are problems with it because you have statistics of, of, of your job. For example, you, you can also check w which stages were executed in uh, when and how, how much resources they used. So usually this is, this is the part. Uh, also, uh, partitioning. Uh, partitioning is an important thing. I, I think I didn't mention it. So the RDDs, the data sets, are split into partitions. You can repartition the data uh, uh, in, in, in any manner. Uh, so sometimes if you, for example, uh, partition them by some 
column, some, some value, for example, I don't know, store number in your big database with, the, with uh, some bills from, 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 from tools. Uh, then it may happen that the, there is a data skew, so uh, what part, some partitions have much more data than, than the others. So then one of the, one of the best, uh, one, one of the best solutions is to repartition the data. It d depends. Uh, the question was, what are the devices for repartition? It depends on on, on, on the use case. So you have uh, you have the hash based partition hash partitioner. Uh, so this one will, uh, if you have a data and they, this is a key value pair, uh, which is pretty pretty usual for for Spark applications. Then by default, this uses the hash based partitioner. So the uh, data with the same key are in the same uh, partition. So that's when the, 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 the uh, data skew can, can happen. But you can use the range-based partitioner. We just takes, we just calculate how many ranges, uh, how, how many elements there are, uh, how many partitions you want, and then just splits, uh, splits them accordingly. So the question is, in what use cases you wouldn't recommend using Spark? Uh, that's a good question. So if you have a repetitive process, a simple job for ingest, ingesting data, I think the, and you want to, uh, you will perform it for multiple data sources. So there, those will be similar data, uh, jobs, but they will be run for different sources. Then, uh, I'm not sure if Spark is the best tool to, 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 to do. Spark is uh, Spark is uh, best used when you can you you need to create some complex queries on top of it and some complex uh, transformations. For example, you want to do some machine learning or you want to do some graph processing. Graph processing was uh, almost unusable using the MapReduce model. In Spark, it's it's much easier because of this lineage feature. So yes, yeah, so some simple, small applications that differ uh, a little bit. So th this is not a use case for Spark, I think. I think a good example would be maybe sort of all up related slice and dice functionality where you might use something like Druid or Elasticsearch maybe for this. Because you know, you need uh, a little bit more caching and indexing, pre-aggregation, that sort of thing, which uh, Spark doesn't mm. really get. Okay. So I think that's all. Thank you. Yeah.